Hello, hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Jennifer. So I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me today uh, as a speaker. It's, I'm very honored. And also thank you to the audience for being here today on a Saturday afternoon. Oops, this slide just go. Okay. So I think the um, previous two speakers have made my life really easy. They're beautifully captured on the role of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So I thought instead of boring, you know, just talking about the same thing, so I'm going to put those treatments into perspective and then uh, look into how we can apply the usage of immunotherapy and targeted therapy into the fastest growing space in oncology, which is in lung cancer. So let's get started. Sorry, this is my disclosure. So essentially, I'll take you through what was the treatment algorithm in the past uh, when we treat patients with early or advanced lung cancer, and what is the current standard of care, and what's new in 2024, and what's emerging. And of course, a little bit on the latest American Society Clinical Oncology uh, updates that just concluded its conference in Chicago two weeks ago. But first, let's start off with some statistics. Okay, so when we look at this pie chart um, that was produced by WHO in 2022, you can see on your left that lung cancer has surpassed breast cancer as the most common cancer globally, taking into account about 12%. And that's a lot. And uh, that is uh, followed by breast cancer at 11 and colon cancer at 10. This is for all sexes. But what really I would like to highlight is the one on the right, which is the mortality rate. Again, lung cancer ranks the highest in terms of cancer-related mortality at 18%. So which means one in four cancer patients that succumb to their cancer actually is attributed by lung cancer. So what does this tell you that all of us has a part to pay, especially the healthcare professionals, all stakeholders, in how we can increase early detection and increase awareness among our community, community so that they seek treatment early when they present with early symptoms. So what about in Malaysia? Of course, it's very important to look at our local data. So from the National Cancer Registry that was last uh, updated in 2016, you can see that among the male, lung cancer is the second most common cancer and fourth among women. But I think soon it will become uh, higher in staging for women. And a lot of time in the women, this predominates in the non-smokers. But what is really sobering and sad for oncologists like me who treat lung cancer and takes it as a deep passion to create awareness is that when you look at the pie chart, majority of the patient present at stage 4, 80%. So a lot of patients come in because the symptoms do not um, resolve, like a chronic cough, or they come in with blood in the phlegm, or even in sites that are not in the lung, like severe bone pain that's not going away. So when they do a staging scan, and they found that they actually have a huge lung mass. So almost every week, one or two patients of mine, if they're female, they come in lung cancer, almost inevitably is a stage 4, and it's a very sad fact. So only less than 10%, in fact, only 8% of Malaysians are presenting with stage 1 and stage 2 disease which we know are the early stage. And just like what Dr. Marwina has said, if the patient is detected early enough, then it can save life because staging is associated with prognosis. So the earlier the patient present with, the smaller the tumor burden, so the less likelihood the survival outcome will be much better. So in the past, the treatment algorithm for metastatic or stage 4 lung cancer has been very simple. So I've com compartmentalized them into palliative chemotherapy. So a lot of the patients will receive either single or double agent with a platinum if they're fit enough to receive palliative chemotherapy, often for four to six cycles, and then it's just observation. A majority of our patients will also undergo palliative radiotherapy because it is a good modality for symptom control, such as bone pain because of bone metastasis or you know, because they have symptoms from the brain 
uh, uh, meds, so we give them radiotherapy. But a majority of them, a big proportion, will end up with just best supportive care. Even sometimes, they end up with just best supportive care alone as the primary modality. And in the past, when a patient is diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, the 5-year overall survival is less than 10%, meaning 1 in 10 patients will make it through 5 years. Again, so much less than many other cancers. What about in the curative uh, stage? So in the past, surgery and even up to today, surgery still remain the cornerstone of treatment, meaning if the patient presents early enough, we will talk to the surgeon, bring them into the surgery room. But if the patient presents with what we know as locally advanced disease, perhaps with some nodal disease, then we often advocate neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So the word neo here presents, meaning you do an induction chemo downstage the disease and then bring them for surgery. And what's next? It's often adjuvant radiotherapy um, if it's indicated and if the patient has no new adjuvant chemo, then they get adjuvant chemotherapy. So the word adjuvant really means, because a lot of patients ask me, I have no more tumor on my pet, so I used to offering me chemo. Because we know that there's always micrometastasis, so that's why we talk about eradication of these micromets to reduce the risk of relapse. And so we do it for stage 2 and above. And what's next after they've completed chemo and radio? It's really just close surveillance follow-up. So every three to six months, you bring them back with or without imaging and really look closely at the symptoms. So is this the best we can do? Is there anything better? And I think you know the answer is yes. And why should we? Because let's look at this chart here. It beautifully tells us that even patients with stage 1 disease early stage, if you're lucky enough to diagnose a patient with stage 1, often it is through incidental finding when they go for employment uh, chest x-ray. So they picked up a nodule and they picked up a stage 1. You can see 25% of patients will still relapse within 5 years. So about a third of the, a quarter of the patient. So if the patient has stage 2 at onset of diagnosis, already 50% of them will relapse in 5 years. And more so if they present with stage Stage 3, up to a two-thirds of them will relapse. So what does this tell us? Lung cancer is never a localized disease. It's always a systemic disease from the get-go. So we need to do better. We need to look into science on how we can improve on their treatment. So impressively, and also I'm very fortunate to be working in an era where we say it's precision medicine. So in the last two decades, there's a boom of fantastic drugs that's coming up, has been touched again by my colleague. So there's immunotherapy. Today I learned a lot from Professor Chin. We'll have a talk after this. And then you look at targeted therapy. Coming from 2004, the introduction of the oral targeted therapy. So we're no longer talking about all patients needs chemotherapy. So you look at lotinib, the oral targeted therapy, and then come into the mid 20th century, you have you know, the second generation, third generation targeted oral, oral targeted therapy, and then come towards the end, you get a boom of all the immunotherapies that's in the landscape. But what's more heartening is that these are not just in the metastatic setting. As we know, all clinical trials will start in the metastatic setting, but we have shift forward the milestone so that now patients are also getting advantage in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. So I think what really changed the landscape in the treatment of lung cancer is the introduction of molecular profiling, which is essentially looking at the genetic blueprint of your patient. So because of cost limitation, you can always order a limited panel, like a limited lung panel, or of course, if it's a very complicated case, like cholangiocarcinoma, then we do an extensive panel, like 161 genes, 500 gene panel, or even tumor mutational burden. So it's really tailored to your patient. And so I think every patient who is diagnosed with lung cancer must have genetic or molecular profiling if cost is not prohibitive. And what really you are doing is to tease out the driver mutation in your patient. So to tease out what are the driver, what are the mutations that is actually leading the carcinogenesis, what is driving the tumour. So it's very personalised to your patient. And the most common mutation in lung is epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, which is prevalent in a non-smoker 
uh, especially Chinese. And so you have also the ALK, which is the uh, ALK fusion or rearrangement gene. And what's important is that you have to test this in the adjuvant setting. So if your patient has undergone surgery, you must be able to find out if they have this because you can use them in the adjuvant setting. And so there's also the ROS1, G12C, and TREC, and the list goes on. So if you remember my earlier slide, you can see now the treatment algorithm has gone so much, so vast. So the first thing is to get the genetic blueprint and then to tease out if they have pdl one expression because that tells us if they are responsive to immunotherapy and then to combine or not with chemotherapy. Again, chemotherapy still remain a backbone uh, in our patient with stage 4. So what about in the curative setting? So again, in those who are borderline, like stage 2B or stage 3, I'm a huge proponent of MDT, just like Dr. Marwinda said. We have a weekly MDT or tumor board meeting where we bring this case up, we do the pd one testing and the mutation, and that the patient has no actionable mutation like EGF or ALK, but they are considered for new adjuvant. We now looked into adding on immunotherapy into the chemotherapy before we bring them to surgery. And following surgery, we know four or six cycles is never enough. So now we're looking into adding on adjuvant immuno for up to a year or even alectinib or osimatinib. So what are these drugs? So we're going to go a little bit more academic. So this is a survival curve, Kaplan-Meier curve, which, which plot time from starting months, from starting the treatment against what is the disease-free, a progression-free period. So you can see a patient with EGFR mutation and they've undergone surgery. If they have EGFR mutation and you put them on this third-generation TKI, known as osimatinib for three years, you can see they consistently do better, even at the four years gap, two-thirds of the patient has not relapsed. So this is a phenomenal result. And again, from last year publication, Alina's study again cement that if you, the patient have ALK fusion upon surgery following that, if you offer them adjuvant electinib for two years, again, they do consistently better than just placebo alone. So it's important to know this in your patient. And the recently concluded ASCO also looked into patient who receive osimatinib and they check minimally residual disease as well as discussed by the previous speaker. They consistently have a sustained MRD free um, in their plasma. When they check the plasma, the MRD free status is much higher in osimatinib, which tells you that when you use target therapy in the right population, you can augment the micro or tumor environment in the patient. So why is in immunotherapy taking such a big hit uh, for new adjuvant setting? Because we know a lot of patients post-op, a lot of them still will relapse. So we're now really looking into shifting the milestone further. So what we do is we offer immunotherapy and chemotherapy before we take them into surgery. And from the three trials that you can see here, which is Checkmate 816 or EGEN, which uses Tuvalumab and K Keynote 67, which uses Pembrolizumab, these are all immunotherapy agents. You can see the patient who received the immunotherapy combination with chemo sustained a better event-free survival. After three years, a lot of them still do not relapse compared to those who just have chemo alone. And what really I want to highlight is the PCR rate, but complete response. So when you offer a patient a new adjuvant therapy, if a quarter of them can go to surgery and have no disease at pathological staging, that's fantastic. And that's what immunotherapy does, as you can see on the bar chart. It's consistently higher with the green chart. So those are the patients across stage 1, 2, and 3, the locally advanced disease. If you offer them IO and chemo first, immunotherapy, they have better chance of developing uh, disease-free even when you take them to surgery. So I'd like to present a case of my patient, Mr. W. He's a 51-year-old gentleman, a chronic smoker, very important history here, 20 pack years. He presented with cough for four months. So he came over to Sunway Emergency Department. We did a chest x-ray. We found an opacity, some haziness on the right side. So he was referred to the chest physician offered a bronchoscopy and the bronchial biopsy confirmed this is adenocarcinoma. So I offered because 
if you looked at the PET scan, it's locally advanced, so it's hard to bring him to surgery up front. He will get positive margin, and that will already reduce his survival outcome. So I offered Mr. W actually three cycles of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and he's done fantastic. Post three cycles of immunotherapy, that was his scan at the bottom bit. So he went on to get a surgery. And he also ran the standard uh, chartered half marathon after his therapy. So I think it tells you that the, you know, the side effect is really tolerable. And one of the things I want to highlight here is oligometastatic disease. Some of you may have heard of this phrase. So basically, it tells you a small number of low-volume disease. What it means is that when you do serial CT scans on your patient because you want to assess response, you might find all these little, little bit of progression. So really, do you take them to surgery or can stereotactic works? So again, I think Dr. Mahmoudah has beautifully captured that there is such radiotherapy technique advancement in it in stereotactic radiosurgery and stereotactic body radiotherapy. The difference here being the SRS is used mainly for the brain, such as gamma knife, and SPRT is used mainly for the bone, lungs, or liver, and uses very high dose to a very small volume, but with high precision. Important thing is to minimize impact. Why are we so concerned? Because 4 out of 10 patients with lung cancer will eventually develop brain metastasis. So it's a very common side of meds. So for a patient who is just diagnosed with lung cancer, I often do an MRI to stitch them from the get-go, even though they're asymptomatic. So if you offer them stereotactic radiosurgery, you lower the risk of neurocognitive decline, less cognitive impairment, less memory forgetfulness, up to 52%. So again, very quickly, a lady who came to see a neurosurgeon and presented with severe headache. This was his MR, her MRI. You can see a huge mass on the left side parietal with the whitish surrounding area, which is the edema. So she came to see me, was diagnosed with lung cancer, and I offered her gamma knife because of her age. She was not keen for surgery. So we did a stage one, which means we did three gamma knife, but over a series of three weeks. So when the volume gets smaller, you can then treat again and continue to provide a very good control. And you can see just eight months down the road, almost completely disappeared with just a little bit of necrosis left. So last but not least, again, let me just take you to what's new now in ESCO, which again tells us that Crown study, again, teasing out the mutation. If your patient has ALK uh, fusion and they're metastatic and you offer them this third generation TKI known as lolatinib, this result is phenomenal. In five years analysis, you can see 60% of the patient has not developed disease progression. And this is something we've never seen in the past. It tells us that this is the era of precision medicine. It's very important to tailor the treatment of your patient according to their genetic blueprint. The LORA study again looked into the EGFR mutant, where if the patient can't go for surgery and you offer them concurrent chemo radiation, what do you do next? You offer them osimatin. It. Mm. And you can see again the disparity of the curve is very, very wide. So those who receive osimatinib following concurrent chemo does significantly better than just placebo alone. So what do I think is the future in lung cancer? I think a lot. I think that's why we're all here today, because we're all here trying to make a difference for our patient. So importantly, I think as a Malaysian, I would like to see that we have early lung cancer screening guideline. Hopefully we can get all the stakeholders together to talk about how we can provide or establish a screening guideline for Malaysian for high-risk population. And we're not talking about just smokers. We're talking about women who, you know, doesn't smoke, but who has husband who smoke, passive smokers, whose mom has history of uh, lung cancer. So all this needs to be ironed out. And whether we know that screening has to be cost-effective, it always comes down to cost. So not every patient of ours in, you know, various part district area can get CT scan on the get-go. So can we use chest X-ray? And can, how can we use AI to assist in this chest X-ray imaging? So these are something that is you know, exciting that's coming up. I always think it's better to be safe. So early detection of recurrence is very important. That's where the CTDNA come in, minimally residual disease. You take them over twice a year to just make sure that you know, the patient has no recurrence. And of course, to look at mechanism of resistance in this group of patients who, despite how good you know, all the results show, eventually will develop resistance towards the therapy. And then what's next for them? 
With that, I end my talk with a quote from Helen Keller, which is, Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. I think that's why the science of oncology is so fantastic that our patients are living longer, but not just longer, but better. So I think what's more important for me as a clinical oncologist is we treat from the heart. So we're not looking at the disease. So a patient comes in, live longer, tells me that he just had a grandson or that you know the children graduate i think these are the important milestones that's why we're all here to try to make a difference thank you very much thank you so much dr jennifer sorry uh, for out now, of time that's fine we will now take questions hi Thank you so much for the excellent talk. Uh, and uh, definitely, the tar immunotherapy, target therapy, it's uh, changed the whole outcome for lung cancer patient. And we, we share the same uh, th challenge that you have in the lung cancer. A majority of the ca lung cancer patients in Qatar, they present stage three, stage four. Yeah. four. So this is a big challenge. Uh, and you mentioned the, uh, so I mean, like the future discussion, this is where, and, but I, I, I would add one more thing, is actually to, to look for no innovative ways of, to, of limiting tobacco mm. exposure. Yes. We need to end the, the game, like I know Malaysia was working into the end game of uh, tobacco, and the, the, even Australia and so on, and then I think COVID things pushed things forward, backward, and stopped this, uh, so really, because Industry is. I'm um, there looking, hundred years from now, how they keep hooking people on tobacco products. So this is this is really we need, and also the discussion that you hint to it, why we are seeing in Asian female, to uh, lung cancer without any exposure to uh, tobacco. So the, the studies now is showing that f Asian female. They are coming with lung cancer without without any, yeah. I mean, even passive, nothing. So that's another way, of, I mean, we need to understand this also. That will give, shed light more on the pathology of disease. So I will, I, I will those two things, I will, yeah, to, under, to understand, and the tobacco, the, the tobacco is, this is, uh, I mean, more now they are coming with this, uh, I mean, new products, vaping, and nicotine pouches, okay. uh, uh, I don't know when they will stop. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a very important point. Thank you very much for raising it. So I think it's a work in progress in terms of smoking cessation, but definitely we are trying to advocate that. So I think it, it's very important to increase the awareness. Yeah, and I think the government is doing a lot to try to, you know, look into the younger generation. Yeah, for the women with non-smoker and still having it, it's a lot to do with the genetic epidemiology and all that. Yeah, epigenetic. But it's important, I think, here, since we're all here in the crowd, to identify, you know, to tell our loved one if they have symptoms. Because a lot of time we brush it off, you know, it's a cough. Yeah, but if it doesn't go away, yeah, to seek, you know, op opinion from a medical doctor. Thank you very much. Oh, hi, Prof. Chi. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for putting the focus firmly back onto the patient's care and quality of life again. Yeah, very important. Yes, it is. You had this huge, complicated chart of the history of immunotherapy uh, and how the progression and how more and more immunotherapy drugs have now come about. What happened to the older drugs? Are they still available in the market? And are the newer drugs just a second generation, third generation of the older ones? Or? Yeah, so a lot of time uh, as the d drug development goes, the drugs get better in combating the resistance. Yeah, so of course it's also more cost uh, prohibitive. So again, the first generation isn't obsolete. Uh, for example, maybe in the government setting, where having a drug is better than none, so they might do first or second generation rather than a third, and then uh, sort of reserve the third generation upon relapse. On the second generation. Mm. So I think the main problem is accessibility. I think it's the same as well all you know, around the world. So we have this fantastic trial, fantastic drugs, but maybe a lot of our patients, you know, more than 50% are not getting it. So the question is how we can increase accessibility to the Malaysians who do not have a comfortable insurance. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, I'm here actually as a patient, Hi. as a cancer survivor. I contracted uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma in the year 2000, 24 years ago. Uh, but just before that, can I comment on the tobacco thing? I'm a former member of parliament for three terms, and I was quite involved in the efforts to push back uh, and get through the, what we call the, to end the use of uh, tobacco wire for young people at least. Unfortunately, uh, the tobacco lobby was too strong for the current government, but I, I'm quite aware that the battle is still on, and I think, I hope to see in Malaysia at least within a number of years that we will try to, you know, end, uh, put in the generation, the end game, uh, the GEG, what we call the GEG plan. Um, back to uh, cancer, sorry. My question is this, because you listed out a whole list of um, uh, targeted chemotherapies. I noticed coincidentally you had selpacatinib on it. I'm actually on cancer, on selpacatinib okay. the last two years. My question is really about, um, I started on vanditinib in 2020. Uh, it, after two years it stopped working. And then the oncologist switched me to selpacatinib. So I'm curious, about, because you put it on your list for lung. Mm. And so uh, is it very common that one, uh, this is a targeted chemo drug, can be used in a variety of uh, cancers, that's one. And uh, second is, why do they suddenly stop working? <laughs> After yeah. having, it worked very well for the first year, and then stopped, uh, slowed down and stopped working. But the self is working, uh, God, uh, thanks to God and, and everybody else, uh, the self is working well at the moment. That, that's thank, my question. Thank you for the question. So, yeah, the sulpacatinib, you know, target a certain mutation. So it depends because cancer is complex. So I always, always often tell my patient, if you just shut one door, sometimes another door will open up the pathway. So if you look at the carcinogenesis pathway, so there's a lot driving. It could be the vascular pathway, the angiogenesis. It could be the, uh, the other pathway. So, but we know there are certain pathways that is the driver. So in that case, like sapocatinib will work. But after a, a certain moment of time, usually about 24 months, 18 to 24 months, you start seeing that the tumor continue to progress because it had now find a new way of actually growing. So there's a different way of it evading the, the, the treatment. So that's why it's important to emphasize to the patient on the compliance as well. Because a lot of patients sometimes they take, but they're not very compliant. That can increase the risk of resistance at a much faster space. Yeah, because um, somehow they will try to inhibit. So one of the hormones of cancer, um, as the beautiful you know uh, chart that we always learn about, I think from my book, and it says that one of it is to invade, evade, yeah, evade detection. So once it's know how the pathway, so consistently, like how I tell my patient is, if every day you go to the highway and you know the policeman's at the federal highway, at some point you're going to perhaps, you know, evade it. Because it's important to put it in simplistic terms and patient can understand rather than a lot of this scientific uh, thing. But, but yes, a lot of time with targeted therapy, I get a bit concerned when it comes about 18 months to 24 months because that's where we start seeing a little bit of progression. But a little bit of progression, like oligo progression, does not mean you have to switch your drugs. You can use radiation therapy as well to just combat it and continue it. Because sometimes progression is not one whole. It could be heterogeneous. So some patients could progress in the lung, but their liver is fantastic. Or they progress in the liver. So you must really look at the patient as a whole, as a single person, and as you know the scan. And what are the symptoms that are really troubling them? Mm. So sapocatinib is uh, currently on a patient access program. Right? It's not available completely in Malaysia, so we have to import it in. And we've used it in lung as well. I wish you all the best treatment.